So we're about to begin. Yesterday, we heard some of the features of Jiva Goswami's life. Fantastic Acharya, not just an author, but a fantastic Acharya that, you know, perhaps one of the outstanding things of all was he continued the momentum and the integrity and the strength of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission after his departure. Of course, the very next generation, Rupa and Sanatan, but easily things could have dissipated as is the nature of how these things happen in the material world, but such an incredible acharya carried forward the integrity, the unity, the purity, the teachings, the guidance, protection, everything. and made arrangements for the next generation to continue after him. Fantastic personality. So, uh, one of the questions yesterday was, um, my goodness, it's missing. What happened? Didn't get saved. Uh, one of the questions yesterday evening was Sri Radhika's question. It's nice to begin this undertaking with the end in mind. So that's, I was thinking about that this morning and prepared something and it's not showing for some reason. I don't know what happened. Um, you'll hear something more about this this evening, but no harm to hear it again or hear it now and then again. Um, A line of disciplic succession, we have four main sampradayas or lines of disciplic succession following from Lord Brahma, there is Madhvacharya and his line from the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, then the Alvars, then Ramanujacharya, Vishnu Swami the Embarkacharya. One of the requirements, traditional requirements of such a foundational uh, disciplic line is to make a statement of commentary on Vedanta Sutra because these are these four lines, they follow the Vedas. And even Shankaracharya, he wrote a commentary on Vedanta Sutra, because what's Vedanta Sutra? We'll hear some more in the course of our presentation this weekend. But Vedanta Sutra is Vyasadeva's summarization of the vast Vedas. What's the message of the vast Vedas? And he presented that in Vedanta Sutra. And each line of disciplic succession creates, the acharya of that succession, creates a commentary on Vedanta Sutra. Why? Because it then Vedanta Sutra is a summary of all the Vedas and they're explaining their line of teaching or rendering of the Vedas through the message of Vedanta Sutra. 
And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did not do that. In fact, he only wrote eight verses. Shikshastakam, the chanting of the holy name. Because that was his medium for entering into Krishna Tattva by Krishna Nam, the holy name of Krishna. And then following him, Rupa Goswami, he wrote many books, especially about bhakti and bhakti rasa, as in bhakti rasamrita sindhu. And he wrote Laghu Bhagavatamrita, another very important work, which is the truths about Krishna. Krishna Tattva, the truths about Krishna, but not a commentary on Vedanta Sutra. And Sanatana Goswami, he wrote books as the successor, as next generation successor Acharyas. He wrote Hari Bhakti Vilas, which is, is a instruction manual on how to be a Vaishnav, how to observe everything, the rituals of involved in Vaishnavism, Gaudiya Vaishnavism, Hari Bhakti Vilas. And he wrote Brihat Bhagavatamrita, which is something of a commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam. But there wasn't a commentary on Vedanta Sutra. And the reason? Lord Chaitanya said there's already a commentary on Vedanta Sutra. What's that? Srimad Bhagavatam is a commentary on Vedanta Sutra. So we don't wish to be presumptuous and make a commentary on Vedanta Sutra when the author of Vedanta Sutra has made his commentary, Vyasadeva, Srimad Bhagavatam. So Jiva Goswami, this, these sit, six Sandarbhas become in essence, the commentary on Vedanta Sutra, without calling it a commentary on Vedanta Sutra. So we'll hear more about it tonight. Um, there are six, so what, what was the purpose of his writing the Sandarbhas, the six Sandarbhas? So there's six. The, the, the book is called, all six together are called Bhagavat Sandarbha. And we'll be discussing, well, we'll discuss a little bit right now. <laughs> Bhagavat Sandarbha means in relation to Bhagavan. Bhagavat is in relation to Bhagavan. <laughs> And what's Bhagavan? Well, we know from Srimad Bhagavatam what Bhagavan is. It's one of the three features of the absolute truth. What's the absolute truth? That from which everything comes. That's what Vedanta Sutra says. So, for example, in his Sandarbhas, in this, um, yeah, in the Sandarbhas, Jiva Goswami gives a commentary on the first five sutras of Vedanta Sutra. And it's in the Bhagavat Sandarbha section, because so, a little confusion. All six are called Bhagavat Sandarbha, or conventionally, more commonly, Sat, or Shat, excuse me, Shat Sandarbha means six. And one of those six is Bhagavat Sandarbha. In fact, it's Sandarbha number two. So here's the names. If you, I meant to show it on the screen, but somehow it, I guess I didn't save it or something. Um, there's six, and they, they, they list as follows. What we're, what we're discussing while we're together is some part of the first one. You know, the, 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 the smallest of the six is Tattva Sandarbha. What does Tattva mean? Tat, tat, 
as in Om Tat Sat. Tat means that, <laughs> the absolute truth. The, 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 the essence of the absolute truth or, and the, the means to know it. We'll see as we begin. The truths, the essence of truth, tattva sandarbha. And then there's th three more that follow in the same line in, in our understanding of, well, maybe I saved it in another place. I'm, try, I'm, I'm trying to respond to Sri Radhika's question from yesterday evening of where's the train going? <laughs> Before we get on board, what's the destination? What are, what are we, where are we headed? What's the goal? What's the end that we're trying to achieve? I'm trying to respond to that question. We're looking at the Sandarbhas because um, these, according to the, 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 the text that's missing is from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur responding to that question. Why are we interested in this subject matter? Why is it so popular and famous and important for the followers of Lord Chaitanya? Because it explains the essence of all truths that there are to be known. It, it's it's essentially a commentary on Vedanta Sutra without calling it a commentary on Vedanta Sutra. It's Lord Chaitanya's teachings. Because it explains Srimad Bhagavatam in its fullness, in a systematic and comprehensive explanation of Srimad Bhagavatam in these six Sandarbhas. Now one way to do that, Jiva Goswami did, is, as I mentioned yesterday, um, he wrote a commentary verse by verse on the entire Srimad Bhagavatam, as Prabhupada has done, verse by verse. That's called Krama Sandarbha. And then he made a co another commentary just on the 10th canto and went more deeply into the 10th canto, verse by verse. And then he went back and did a commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam, commentary number three, that's topic by topic. Why is Srimad Bhagavatam so important? Lord Chaitanya accepted. Lord Chaitanya's teachings are Srimad Bhagavatam. And Srimad Bhagavatam is Lord Chaitanya's teachings. If we want to know who is Lord Chaitanya, read Srimad Bhagavatam. Because Srimad Bhagavatam gives support to the chanting of the Holy Name. Through the chanting of the Holy Name, one can realize Krishna, which is the subject matter of Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna. We'll see this in just a moment. But we, we, we want, why are we doing this? We, we want to know Krishna in an authoritative way, in a systematic and comprehensive authoritative way. And so he has these six sandarbhas that do that topic by topic. So the first one is Tattva Sandarbha, and the next one is Bhagavat Sandarbha. Because why? Later comes Krishna is Bhagavan, but before even Krishna's Bhagavan for his readers, who could be from any Sampradaya, he's presenting the message of our Sampradaya that Bhagavan is the absolute truth, because that's what Vedanta Sutra inquires. What is that from which everything comes? And the message of the Bhagavatam is Bhagavan is the source of everything. And what's the message? I'm making it short can be much longer. Two things. 
The Bhagavan conception includes two things. God is a person. Anyone who has given extended Krishna consciousness to others will know this very well. Whoever is out there in the spiritual marketplace that has an idea of spirituality, even if they, 80%, don't have an idea that the, the source of everything is a person, and even those that say that the source of everything is a person don't really believe it. <laughs> In short, without elaborating. So, the, the source of everything is a person. And the other features of the Supreme rest upon that person. So we can, the next Sandarbha is Paramatma Sandarbha. So, using language that Radhika Raman uses, you just shrink the features of Bhagavan and it becomes Paramatma. But the fullness is Bhagavan. And Bhagavan is a person and Bhagavan has unlimited potencies. It's a very essential message. I'll say it again. It's a very essential message in Bhagavat and Dharva that if we're to understand God in Jiva Goswami's language, you must accept that he has innumerable and inconceivable potencies, otherwise there's no possibility of understanding God in his fullness. So, Bhagavad, those potencies that deal with material creation, time, prakriti, jiva, and the relationship of all of them, similar as is done in Bhagavad Gita, you know, those, those five topics of Bhagavad Gita. But it starts with Bhagavan. Krishna is the source of, he is the supreme feature of Bhagavan. That's the Krishna Sandarbha. So that's the first four Sandarbhas. From our, what we're accustomed to in ISKCON, the Hare Krishna movement, this is called Sambandagyan. Knowledge of all things in relation to their source of emanation. It covers everything. And Krishna is that source. He's a person with inconceivable, unlimited potencies. That's what the Bhagavatam discloses. So in a systematic and comprehensive way, voluminous, mind-spinning detail, he explains it on the authority of Bhagavatam. It's an exposition on what is the message of Srimad Bhagavatam. There's two more Sandarbhas. So Abhideya, Bhakti Sandarbha, it's the biggest of the six Sandarbhas. And then following Bhakti is Prayojana, the goal that he calls Preeti Sandarbha. More or less, Jiva Goswami likes the word Preeti, and so he uses it interchangeably with what we're accustomed to as Prema. And they have the same Sanskrit root. So, love of God, achieved through the process of bhakti, unto whom? And as Prabhupada would say, that they do not know. <laughs> God is great, but how great he is, that they do not know. So this is how great he is. He's a person. He's an unlimited person. You know, an impersonalist will argue, well, that limits... God, as soon as you put person with form, he's limited. Unlimited is formless. Form is limiting. No, form is not limiting. If you say God cannot have form, that's limiting. There's something he can't do. God can't have potencies, they say. Because then there's two things. There's God and his potencies. So he can't have potency, he's just neutered him. No, he has potencies. And, 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 and then what's the relationship between those potencies and him? That's what, where Vaishnava Sampradayas have different perspective without going into it. 
But Jiva Goswami presents the Bhagavatam perspective, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching. In fact, I share a little piece of information. The term Achintya Beta Beta Tattva wasn't present during Lord Chaitanya's times. It was given by Jiva Goswami. Another contribution of that great Acharya. And that, that teaching, Achintya Beta Beta Tattva, not only describes the relationship of potencies, but everything. Like the expansions, the various avatars, the various forms of the Lord. And we'll hear about it in the Mangala Charna, in the last verse that we'll be discussing this morning. Verse number eight. So we're going to, why are we doing this? What's the objective? We're going to, if, if, if we were to continue with this, we would get the big panorama of Lord Chaitanya's teachings or the Bhagavatam's teachings. And what's the Bhagavatam doing? It's disclosing Krishna. Here he is, or here I am. <laughs> because one of the uh, one of the teachings in Bhagavat Sandarbha of Jiva Goswami is Krishna is the speaker of the Bhagavatam and he gives scriptural reference to support it. Part of it's right in the Bhagavatam, but without all the detail. Krishna is speaking, just like we say Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is speaking about himself. What other scriptures of the world are you aware of? where it's not someone speaking about God, but God speaking about himself. Pretty special, unique. God speaking about, I'm like this. The Bhagavatam similarly is Krishna speaking because he's, he presented, in short, he presented the Bhagavatam to Lord Brahma in the four nutshell verses. But the, the, all of the Vedas, including the Bhagavatam and all of the Vedas, all the Puranas and all the Itihasas, and we're going to hear as we go along, everything in its diversity, everything comes from Krishna. We'll hear it, scripturally stated. Now Krishna's revealing Krishna. Because who can reveal Krishna better than Krishna? I'm like this. But he's doing it through the agency like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu would do through his devotees. His devotees are revealing these things. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Excuse me. Hare Krishna. At least it was a good call. It was somebody verifying they're going to send out the links for people who can't come to this presentation. Sorry. Okay. We're going down this path so that we can understand Krishna in an authoritative systematic and comprehensive way. And our means for knowing Krishna is what the main focus of this is, that is Srimad Bhagavatam. That is faith, as I said yesterday evening, faith in what we're doing is the right thing. Chanting of the holy name and hearing regularly from Srimad Bhagavatam is the right thing. We're doing the right thing. How do we know that? We're going to be hearing how we know that. What's the evidence? For that, the pramana, the means of knowing we're doing the right thing. You know, it's, it will strengthen and support our faith in what we're doing in Krishna consciousness, in practicing devotional service. And prepare us so that if we meet someone that, that is um, challenging, how do you know? We'll have an answer. Well, besides, you know, Prabhupada said it. I heard it. 
We hear lots of things, and why do we accept this one as opposed to other things? The, the challenging person may not accept their conclusion, but at least you can be thoroughly convinced if you listen very carefully. So what we're about to commence. Okay, so this morning uh, we'll be discussing uh, the first four of the eight verses of the Mangala Charana. And we'll then go into some definitions of what Mangala Charana means, just like the, the RT that begins at 4.30 in the morning is called Mangala RT. So Mangala doesn't mean, you know, the, the early. It, it literally it means auspicious. Mangala means auspicious. And Mangala Charana literally means an enactment of auspiciousness. Just like when we perform yagyas in ISKCON, we recite prayers or we have the appearance day of an acharya, etc. What do we do? We recite Mangala Charana prayers. Correct? It's right in our songbook and we just recite those verses. What's the purpose? Enactment of auspiciousness on an auspicious day or an auspicious event through sound vibration. One is to create auspiciousness or Mangala Charna. So these eight prayers are Mangala Charna prayers. They are, they are an enactment of auspiciousness. Now, uh, here's another definition. This is given by Baladev Vidyabhusan. We'll hear some more about him. He, he actually, so many generations later, he officially wrote a commentary on Vedanta Sutra without the circumstances. Jiva Go I'm sure, without a doubt, he made reference in writing his Govinda Bhasha commentary on Vedanta Sutra. He, he read the Sandarbhas, or was not only read them, he was making thorough reference to the subject matter of Vedanta, of what we're studying. So, in that very, very first verse, Vedanta Sutra 111, he writes, because he creates a, common, a Mangala Charna, and he says that what a Mangala Charna is, it's to remove obstacles and assure successful completion of one's book. So before he began writing his Govinda Bhasha, he wrote Mangala Charna. These two things, remove obstacles and assure successful completion. We'll hear some more about assure successful completion in a moment. Um, Similarly, in his uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, a Mangala, series of Mangala Charna verses are there, written by Krishna Das Kaviraj, and then he gives, as you see, Adi Lila, chapter one, verse 22, a definition. So what are we doing here? We're, we're entering into Mangala Charna, what's that? Mangala Charna involves three processes, defining the objective. And you'll see the Sanskrit here, vastu nirdesha, defining the objective. Two, offering benedictions, ashirvada, and offering obeisances, namaskar, those three things. Defining the objective, offering benedictions and offering obeisances. So we're going to go through each one of these three just now. Vastu Nirdesha, or in the commentary, it becomes a little longer, Vastu Nirdeshatmika, which means um, from Jiva Goswami's Vastu Nirdesha, what he does in these eight verses, 
he establishes what's the subject matter of these six, because Mangala Charan is not just for this one book, it's for the all six of them. The Bhagavatam itself is the subject, is the vastu. So within the Mangala Charna prayers, he states, the subject of this text is Srimad Bhagavatam. And then he adds, you'll see in, the, in verse number eight, in addition, um, the Supreme Lord Krishna is the subject or the substance, along with his various expansions, the avatars, and Narayana in Vaikuntha, and Paramatma, who's controlling the material nature, etc. Because that's part of Krishna Tattva. So there's two. There's the Bhagavatam itself, and, and what does the Bhagavatam disclose? Krishna in his fullness. So that's Vastu Nirdesha established in these Mangala Charna prayers. Then comes Ashirvada or Ashir Vadatmika, he, you know, making uh, or giving of blessings. So traditionally, by the way, this is coming directly from Jiva Goswami's commentary. So just, he wrote the book and he wrote a commentary on the book. Um, praying to the Lord for his blessings or bestowing blessings upon the reader or very simply just saying all glories to Krishna. These are examples of Ashirvada. I learned that word just by, you know, moving around in India. People would come and Ashirvada Maharaj. You want your blessings. Tell a little Prabhupada story just for appreciation. Um, Tamal Krishna Maharaj told me the story that when traveling in trains, especially um, going around doing uh, Pandal programs and so forth and so on, there was a period of time when Prabhupada was doing that a lot. So they, they arranged for a, a, a little, his own compartment in the first class train and Tamal Krishnamarsh sitting shotgun at the doorway so nobody would come in. Because <laughs> they didn't want anybody to disturb Prabhupada. So he had to answer the call of nature so he left and sure enough when he came back there was somebody sitting in the compartment asking Prabhupada for Ashirvada for his blessings. And Tamal Krishnamaraj wanted to muscle the guy, get out of here, and you're disturbing our spiritual master. And Prabhupada said, no, he's come for Ashirvad. So the man with his palms folded said, Swamiji, please give your blessings. He said, very well, I'll give my blessings. Tamal Krishnamaraj, please bring the sannyasis from the other car, the second class car. So he brought them all standing, you know, they crowded into Prabhupada's little compartment there and Prabhupada said, my blessings are you may become like them. <laughs> Renounce from the material world of sense gratification and devoting yourself simply to Krishna. <clears throat> the man's eyes got really big and he got really nervous and said, well, Swamiji, it's been very nice being with you and thank you very much and quickly ran out of the apartment, the compartment and everybody laughed. That's Ashirvat. So it's one of the three elements, according to Krishna Das Kaviraj, that found in a Mangala Charana. Then next, the third is Namaskar. Namaskar, you know, with folded palms. Namaskar. And what is Namaskar? Namaskriyatmaka. It means um, paying obeisances specifically, Jiva Goswami's rights to one's teachers or one's worshipable deity or, <clears throat> or both. These are found in a Mangala Charana. 
<coughs> One more example or instruction teaching of what a Mangalacharana is is found in Sarva Samvadini. What's that? Sarva Samvadini is Jiva Goswami's commentary on the entire Satsandarbha. And I appreciate the, the, the meaning of Sarva Samvadini, that which harmonizes everything. In case you're not so clear about this or that, read Sarva Samvadini and it harmonizes everything. So, in his Sarva Samvadini, Jiva Goswami, from uh, authoritative scripture, describes or presents that there are four essential elements in a book, and the Mangalacharana addresses those four. Are you ready to hear what those four are? Here's the Sanskrit Adhikari. is one of them, Sambandha, Vishaya, and Prayojanam. Now we're familiar in ISKCON with these Sambandha, Abhideya, Prayojana. We hear it all the time. Uh, so be ready for that classic understanding that we're accustomed to, taken in a different way because it's, it's appropriate and it's from the scripture. So at the beginning of at its beginning, a book must describe these four items. One, the qualifications of the person who may read the book. Adhikari, same meaning as we commonly take. Adhikari means qualification. So, who should read this book? And he states it very, very clearly in his Mangalacharana. Then this word sambandha that we're accustomed to is used in a different way. Sambandha means relationship. There's a similar word in Hindi. Sambandha means relationship. In Sanskrit, it means relationship. So relationship. So we're accustomed to hearing relationship in terms of Krishna and everything that comes from him and the relationship of everything comes from him from, with Krishna, the source. Sambandha again. That's what we're used to hearing. This is a little different. It's the same word, Sambandha, but it's the book and the subject. The book and the relationship between the book and the subject of the book. So the book is the Bhagavatam and the subject of the book is Krishna. And he states it in the Mangalacharana. You'll see there's a little bit more on this in just a moment. The subject itself. So there's the book and its subject and its relationship. The subject itself. Vishaya. That's this word up here, Vishaya. Or Abhideya. And what the reader will gain by reading the book and following the path it describes prayojana. So we're going to break these down. Oh, yeah. There, there's two um, persons shown here. One is Jiva Goswami and the other is a painting of Baladev. Not really a portrait or something, but it's an artist drawing Baladev Vijibhusan. These two wrote commentaries on... Tattva Sandarbha. Jiva Goswami wrote commentary on all the Sandarbhas. And Baladev wrote commentary on Tattva Sandarbha. So what we're going to be hearing is largely drawn from these two commentaries. And these, so these four subject matters, at the very end, the Mangalacharna verse number eight, we're going to hear more about those four. Adhikari, Sambandha, Vishaya, and Prayojana. So stick around and we'll hear some more detail. Now, here's, we saw this before, the invocation verse, 
This is Jiva Goswami's own writing. Shri Krishna Jayati. May Krishna be glorified. So that's the objective. That's the Sandarbhas. Glorification of Krishna and glorification of the messages of the Srimad Bhagavatam itself. And what he wants to do, he accomplishes. He manifests Krishna he, by glorifying him and the ways in which the Bhagavatam reveals him. Somebody turned on the air conditioning and it's really cold. I don't know why. Somebody know how to fix that problem? It's cold out. We don't need cold air blowing on us. Thank you. Okay. So now we're going to head into the Mangala Charana. And the very first text is a very famous verse, famous within ISKCON for sure, where um, the appearance of the personality of Godhead as Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is described. Let's say it together. Krishna Varnam Trisha Krishnam Sangopangastra Parshadam Yagyai Sankirtana Prayayar Yajantihi Sumeda Saha. Translation In the age of Kali, intelligent persons perform congregational chanting to worship the Lord who constantly sings the names of Krishna. Now comes the first line, translated here in the middle. Although his complexion is not blackish, he is Krishna himself. He is accompanied by his associates, servants, weapons, and confidential companions. Now, in the first verse of Chaitanya Charitamrita and Chaitanya Bhagwat and other very exalted standard Vaishnav literature, the initial verse is composed by the author. In this verse, Jiva Goswami purposely chose to not compose his own, but to cite a verse from the Bhagavatam. And by citing the verse from the Bhagavatam, subtly, he is indicating this is about the Bhagavatam. And it's also, um, in addition to the, 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 the book, the Sat Sandarbhas, is about the Bhagavatam. Uh, this, this is the, using those four things, uh, excuse me, Vasta Nirdesha, Vastu Nirdesha, that, that Krishna Das Kaviraj says, he's fulfilling this purpose, Vastu, the subject of this book is Srimad Bhagavatam. You with me? The subject of this book is Srimad Bhagavatam. Just by citing a verse from the Bhagavatam, he's doing that. And in addition, he is honoring his Ishtadev, his worshipable deity. Um, because Jiva Goswami accepts Lord Chaitanya as his worshipable Lord. We heard yesterday evening that his deity was Radhadamadhar, given to him by Rupa Goswami. He worshipped his deity of Radhadamadhar, but his worshipable Lord was Lord Chaitanya. So in this verse, he's offering his obeisances, namaskar, to his worshipable Lord, Lord Chaitanya. Um, in all of the Sandarbhas, this first Tattva Sandarbha, uh, is presenting the thesis. This is the overall thesis of this Sandarbha. The Srimad Bhagavatam is the perfect authority. That's our subject matter 
for these four and a half days. Srimad Bhagavatam is the principal authority for knowing anything, especially transcendence and particularly Krishna. He wants to glorify Krishna. That's the invocation. What's the best way to glorify Krishna? Before we begin glorifying Krishna, we need proper knowledge, the means of knowing Krishna before we begin glorifying Krishna. That's how he starts. That's verse 9 after the Mangala Charana. Um, to reveal the glories of Krishna, we have to have proper authority for doing so. And uh, there's a very wonderful verse. Those of you that have read Prabhupada's books or have heard him speak, you know this verse. Arajo Bhagavan Vrajesha Tanayas Taddhama Vrindavanam Ramya Kadachit Upasana Vrajavidhu Sargena Ya Kalpita. Now, this line that I highlighted in big red letters. Shastram Bhagavatam Pramanam Amalam. Starting with verse 9 is called the Pramana section or Pramana Kanda. What does Pramana mean? We'll hear about it this evening, but we'll hear about it now also. Pramana means valid source of knowledge or the means by which you can know something. How do you know anything? How do you know I exist? You know, Descartes was questioning, how do I know that I exist? Well, I th think, therefore, I know that I exist. Right? Very, very, very brilliant. I think, therefore, I am. So how do we, the, the means that the, we'll hear, starting in verse 9, this, how do we know that the Bhagavatam is the best means of knowing things? How do you know, how, what are the possible ways of knowing things? So this, this Tattva Sundarbha is establishing that Srimad Bhagavatam is Pramanam Amalam. Amalam means spotless. Here's the, the translation of the verse. Very beautiful verse. Very, very famous, important verse for followers of Lord Chaitanya. The Supreme Lord is to be worshipped. Excuse me. The Supreme Lord to be worshipped is the son of the king of Raja. Who's that? Krishna. Nanda. Sutta or Nanda Prajesha Tanigas. The son of the king of Raja. His personal abode is Vrindavan. The most favorable mode of serving him is that which pra was practiced by the young maidens of Raja, the gopis. This is Lord Chaitanya's teaching. And the scripture, Bhagavatam, is the spotless source of reliable knowledge. And pure love of God is the supreme goal of life. Such are the opinions of Gora Mahaprabhu, and we therefore respect them implicitly. So naturally, he's a, a devotee of Lord Chaitanya, describing these are essential things that Lord Chaitanya revealed. Who is the supreme worshipable object? What is his abode? What is the very, very best means of worshiping him? What's the best means of knowing him? Srimad Bhagavatam. So this whole, what we're doing together is discussing that topic, the best means of knowing Krishna. The, the verse from the 11th Canto, chapter five, uh, is spoken by, um, one of these fellows, these are the Navayogendras. They were free to travel throughout the universe. And 
one of the places they traveled, and they, they went to just give Krishna Bhakti. And one of the places they came was to a place where King Nimi, there's King Nimi, he was engaged in the performance of a yagya, and right in the middle of that arrangement of the yagya, whoops, this is King Nimi, lo and behold, here come the Navayogendras. He just stopped the from the verse, Sangastra, Sangha Sangastra Parshadam, this word Anga means Krishna's, or Lord Chaitanya's, excuse me, his personal expansions. Who are those? If you think of the Panchatattva, they're to Lord Chaitanya's right. Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Lord, Lord Chaitanya, excuse me, his Sri Advaita, personal expansions. Who are those? If you think of the Panchatattva, they're to Lord Chaitanya's right. Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Lord, Lord Chaitanya, excuse me, his Sri Advaita, personal expansions. Who are those? If you think of the Panchatattva, Pardon, we're having they're to Lord Chaitanya's right. Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Lord. Swami was after Madhvacharya and before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu from another sampradaya, not the same sampradaya as Madhvacharya and Lord Chaitanya. We'll hear some more. But he wrote a commentary on Srimad Bhagavatam, verse by verse. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu accepted that commentary is proper, and it, anyone who after Sridhar Swami writes commentary must write commentary pursuant to Sridhar Swami's commentary. And Jiva Goswami does that in his Sandarbhas. So on this verse from the 11th canto, chapter 5, Srimad Bhagavatam, here's what Sridhar Swami says, that this Trishak Krishna, it's a compound word, Trisha means complexion, and it can be read Trisha Krishnam or Trisha Akrishnam. Shridhar Swami, Jiva Goswami points it out, he wrote that when Swayam Bhagavan Krishna appears once in a day of Brahma, his complexion in the following Kali Yuga is also blackish, meaning he's also Krishna. Although he assumed the complexion of Radha, he is Krishna himself. Now he wrote this before Lord Chaitanya appeared. He didn't have the advantage that Jiva Goswami and those after Lord Chaitanya had. But that's what he writes in his commentary. Now, similarly, those that are a little familiar with um, Kavi Karnapur, another devotee of Lord Chaitanya, he wrote a book called Gauragona Desh Dipika. In that Gauragona Desh Dipika, it's like a who's who on people in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes, who were they in Krishna's pastimes? In that book, Gauragona Desh Dipika, he writes the name and the color of the other 999 Yuga avatars for Kali Yuga is blackish. You with me? Did I lose anybody? We'll do it again? We're okay. There's 1,000 yuga, yuga cycles in each day of Brahma. So there's 1,000 Kali Yugas in each day of Brahma. 999 of those Kali Yugas, the Yuga avatar is blackish. And when Krishna appears, he's golden. Excuse me, when the Kali Yuga following, when Swayam Bhagavan Krishna appears and performs his pastimes in Vrindavan, that one is golden. But they're all Krishna. But when the other 999, he doesn't, Krishna doesn't show his pastimes in Vrindavan, and it's not Krishna himself who appears as 
as the Yuga avatar, but he's blackish in color. So that's what Shuddhar Swami writes in his commentary on this 11th canto verse. Now here's what uh, Jiva Goswami writes in his commentary on this verse in Sarva Samvadani, um, that the compound word Twisha, the complexion, is a Krishna, not blackish. And he concludes, that's golden. Okay. So he asked the question, somebody might raise the question. Why golden? And he gives the answer. Why golden? And the, the answer comes from another verse in Srimad Bhagavatam, which has to do with a description of the Yuga avatars, which includes Kali Yuga, and it comes from a verse in the 10th canto where Gargamuni is performing the name-giving ceremony for Krishna and Balaram in a cowshed. Those who are practicing devotees, you're very familiar with this. In that name-giving ceremony, so Gargamuni was like super astrologer. He wasn't like one of these guys that you know, takes your money, doesn't really know what the heck he's doing. He was a super, super, super astrologer. And everybody knew it. So Nanda Maharaj went to Gargamuni and said, can you do the, the chart for these two boys and give their names? Namakarana is one of the sangskars. It's one of the duties parents to ap approach a proper brahmana for this. So... He did. And in the verse from the Bhagavatam spoken by Gargamuni, uh, here's the verse. Uh, especially this last line will make reference. Shukla rakta tatapita. Iditam krishnatam Gatai, Gata, I can't read. Your son Krishna appeared in previous yugas as yuga avatar with three different colors, white, red, and yellow. And now he has appeared in a blackish color. So the yuga avatar for Satya Yuga is whitish. Shukla. And that whitish avatar is Kapiladev or Hungsa avatar or others that in Satya Yuga are whitish. And then in Treta Yuga, reddish. Commonly, Yagya, a form of Lord Vishnu who appears reddish in color. And now Krishna's in the blackish color. And then that leaves one more. That's the Kali Yuga avatar who is yellow or uh, Pita, just like the color of Krishna's dhoti is Pita, is one of his names, Pitambar. His dhoti is that color. So that's why golden, because Gargamuni said it. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is that person who is being described in that 11th canto verse, chapter 5. Jiva Goswami is, you know, being very careful that persons who are readers of his book may not be followers of Lord Chaitanya. So what's the, how do you get away with saying that verse is speaking about Lord Chaitanya? The verse by Gargamuni from the Bhagavatam. And we're still on the first verse. I didn't get very far. I better hurry up. <clears throat> Jiva Goswami, in his commentary, Sarva Sambhadani, he raises a doubt. Wait a minute. Some people may say, wait a minute. One of the names of the Supreme Lord is 
Triyuga. Tri means three. He appears in three yugas. And in fact, there's a verse in Srimad Bhagavatam that confirms this. Listen to this verse. It's Prahlad Maharaj speaking in Canto 7 where he's speak, offering prayers to Lord Nishringadeva where he says, in this way, my Lord, you appear in various incarnations as a human being, as an animal, as a great saint, a demigod, a fish, a tortoise, thus maintaining the entire creation and killing the enemies of the world. According to the age, O oh my Lord, you protect the principles of religion, period. In the age of Kali, however, you are unmanifested, chana, and therefore you are known as Triyuga. It's one of the names of the Lord, Triyuga. So Jiva Goswami raises the question, wait a minute, Wait a minute, the Lord is Triyuga, and you're saying this verse from the Bhagavatam is speaking of the Lord appearing as Lord Chaitanya. Wait a minute, he's Triyuga. And not only that, Jiva Goswami helps the doubting persons by giving another scriptural reference that uses the same word Triyuga. In one of the Upa Puranas, Vishnu Dharmotara Purana, Lord Hari is not seen to assume a manifest form in Kali Yuga. He appears only in the other three ages, beginning with Krita or Satya Yuga. Therefore, he is called Triyuga. But when the Kali Yuga has reached its end, Lord Vasudev enters into the body of Kalki the proponent of Vedic truth and reestablishes order in the world. Okay. Now, I'm a doubting person. What about these references and you saying that verse from the Bhagavatam, Canto 11, Chapter 5, is about Lord Chaitanya? How is that? He's Triyuga. So now, this word chana, we, those who have been around for a while, know we refer to Lord Chaitanya as chana avatar. He's chana concealed um, here's very interesting on that verse from 7th canto Sridhar Swami in his commentary writes as follows you the supreme lord both protect and kill it's directly in the verse you know pritranaya sadhanam vinashaya he comes to protect and he comes to kill but in Kali Yuga, you do not do this because at that time you are concealed. Chana. Therefore, since you openly appear only in three yugas, you're known as Triyuga. Cool, huh? Lord Chaitanya doesn't kill. What does he do? He chants. Those are his astras. He doesn't use a Sudarshan chakra and chop people. That's what happened with um, those two brothers, what are their names? Jagai Madhai. Lord Chaitanya pulled out his Sudarsan chakra and was ready to chop him. And Lord Nitinda said, no, you can't do that. In this incarnation, you don't do that. You can't chop him. Put that Sudarsan chakra away. Give your mercy to them. Oh. Well, I can only give my mercy to them if they fall at your feet and beg forgiveness. They fell at his feet and beg forgiveness. So Lord Chaitanya put his Sudarshan Chakra away and used the holy name instead. That was his Astra. So Chana Avatar. And other than that, we don't hear about Sudarshan Chakra appearing in Lord Chaitanya's hand because he's Chana Avatar. You follow? And that's before Lord Chaitanya appeared. This is what Sridhar Swami said. And here's what Jiva Goswami said when he knew more than Sridhar Swami did about the life of Lord Chaitanya. He comments the Vishnu Dhamotara's denial of a Yuga avatar in Kali 
may apply to other Kali Yugas, but not to the present one. Why? This is the 28th Kali Yuga in the seventh Manvantar on the day of Brahma, whew, called the Sweta Varaha Kalpa. Well, we're going to hear more about the Sweta Varaha Kalpa later. Don't worry about it for now. It's a very, very special day of Brahma, in short. So, in this day of Brahma, there's how many yuga cycles in the day of Brahma? 1,000. And there's how many Manus? 14 in each day of Brahma. And during Manu number 7, that's our present Manu, in the 28th cycle, because he gets 71 of the 1,000, Krishna appears. And when Krishna appears, in this very special, of, in the day of Brahma, that's a long time, only once in each day of Brahma does the personality of Godhead Sri Krishna personally descend on earth in his original form. Jiva Goswami writes, when Krishna appears in his original form once in the day of Brahma, Granga appears in the very next Kali Yuga. Granga is so special. He is a special manifestation of Krishna himself. And because this very special manifestation of Krishna himself, the very rare descent of Krishna, is not just another avatar, but the ultimate source of all forms of Godhead. When he appears, his unlimited potency overrules the general pattern, and he comes again in Kali Yuga. That's Jiva Goswami's explanation of this Vishnu Dhamotara passage, the Triyuga passage. And then he concludes, the Lord is not directly visible or is covered, Chana, in Kali Yuga. Thus, the Lord is described as appearing in the other three Yugas. Now, um, there's one other reference for those of you that like Chaitanya Charitamrita and then we're going to stop for questions. And he only got through Mangala Charna, verse 1. Um, when Lord Chaitanya went to Puri, he was alone because the others traveling with him, Lord Chaitanya insisted he didn't want to enter Puri with them because they had just broken his danda and like that. It was a leela. So he went alone, he saw Lord Jagannath, and he went running towards the altar of Lord Jagannath because he saw Krishna, not just Lord Jagannath. And in his anticipation of love, of embracing Krishna, he fainted. Not just fainted, he went into trance. The guards saw this sannyasi lying in, on the floor. They got out their sticks and they were going to toss him out of the temple room making a disturbance. Look at this fellow. Just as they were about to toss him out, Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya came and said, no, no, no. This is a sannyasi. You can't just toss him out. Make an arrangement and bring him to my home. So they did that. And many things happened. Sarvabhuma Bhattacharya tested while he's lying there in trance, because he's a, he's a scholar. And he knew all kinds of things, like when people are faking and when they're genuine. So when someone is in trance, their life air is suspended. When someone's faking, they're breathing. They're not in trance. So he took little fibers of cotton and held it before the nostrils of Lord Chaitanya to see if he was faking or in trance. They hardly moved. His life airs were suspended. So it was, wow. He's the real thing. And then his brother-in-law, Gopinathachari was his brother-in-law. You know, Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya's wife had a brother, and her brother was Gopinathacharya. 
Gopinath Acharya said, you know, some, many things happened. But he said, even the personality of Godhead comes to your home and you don't know who he is. You're such a scholar. And Sarvabhoma said, well, wait a minute here. The Lord is known as Triyuga. So how can you say he's the personality of Godhead? When you speak things in spiritual circles, you must make reference to scripture. And scripture says he's Triyuga, one of the names of the Lord. So what was Gopinath Acharya's response about this Triyuga point? Who knows? Yes. Did you hear? In Kali Yuga, there's no Leela avatar, but there's a Yuga avatar. There must be a Yuga avatar. There's a Yuga avatar in all the four Yugas. Triyuga refers to the Leela avatars. Now in this Vishnu Dhamotara verse, please note, at the end, there's a sandhi, a juncture when this one ends, the necron begins, and that little period is called the sandhi. That's when Kalki avatar, he comes at the end, but it's at the end. So there's no Leela avatar. This is what he says. In this age of Kali, there's no Leela avatar of the Supreme Personality God. It, therefore, he is known as Triyuga. That is one of his holy names. There is certainly an incarnation in every age, and such an incarnation is called the Yuga avatar. So, Gopinath Acharya, being a devotee, he understood Lord Chaitanya's Yuga avatar. Just as that verse, Krishna Varnam Trisha Krishna says, as the question was being asked by to Karabhajana Muni from King Nimi, there's a yuga avatar, and he's golden, Trusha Krishna. And he has his angas and upangas and parshadas and astras and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So we're done because time ran out and um, we'll start after breakfast with Verse number two, Mangala Charna. In verse number two, Jiva Goswami explains verse number one. It's his own language. Okay, so any comments or questions? Do we have a portable microphone or no? Here comes the portable microphone. Look at this. Can you hand it to... Can you hand, just raise your hand? Okay. Can you stay, hand, stay by and, or somebody can be the runner for this? Go ahead. Hare Krishna. Um, so was Jiva Goswami the first Acharya to, um, to see that verse referring to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? No. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. There were other, he, he heard from Rupa Goswami. So, you know, likely he heard from Rupa Goswami the meaning of that verse. Don't know. Another question, may I ask? Yeah. Um, so, it, it, the Sarva Samvadini is a commentary on the Shat Sandarbhas Shat by yes. Jiva Goswami? Yes. So, it's a different book altogether. Yes, a different book altogether. And there's no translation yet for that? Or? Oh, yes, there is. Oh. Well, Banu Swami's done the translation of Sarva Samvadini, at least for this Tattva Sandarva. At least for Tattva Sandarva. That much I know. And Gopi Pranadana Prabhu. In this book, those of you that were fortunate enough to get one, in the back, there's a translation of Sarva Samvadini by Gopi Pranadana Prabhu for Tattva Sandarva. One more question. Um, it, it's very enthusing to hear about Jiva Goswami's commentaries on, uh, or, or, or expansions on the Bhagavatam and his Sandarbhas. Oh, keep your seatbelt fastened. It gets really interesting. And uh, my thoughts were going to what I've heard from you so many times about how Gopal Bhatt Goswami is the source of those Sandarbhas. It's coming up in the Mangala Charna prayers. Okay. I wanted to hear Stay more tuned. about that. It's coming. Because
Back, in the back. Raise your hand. Guru Maharaj, I got a little bit confused by uh, the two quotes that you posted there. Yes. Um, so one was um, when Kavi Karnapur says that um, when Krishna appears um, as Yuga Avatar in all the other 999 Yugas, he appears in the color blackish. And then... Which, in, which is similar to what Sridhar Swami says. Yes. And Jiva Goswami's gloss is, a, is different. So our, there, these are examples, don't be surprised, it happens, where commentators don't say the same thing. Yes, so whatever they say has the scriptural basis for what they say. Um, but there is uh, somewhat a contradiction, it looks like, because um, in Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, the verse that you quoted from um, Garga Muni's yeah. Nam Karan, um, in that um, it is stated that Krishna is appearing in the previous yuga as white, red, and yellow. yellow. So it is not, uh, the yellow is following Krishna's. That's correct. So well, Gargamuni is not an ordinary fellow, please remember. And so what Gargamuni is saying and what Kavi Karnapur is saying and Shuddhar Swami are saying differ, mm -hmm. it appears. Now, he's saying what he said, Gargamuni said what he said. Mm -hmm. In the next age, he's, he's yellow or golden in color. He doesn't say, you know, what copy, 999 he's blackish and, and one he's, he didn't say that, he said yellow. So it's not necessarily, because otherwise Kavya Karnapur is not going to say it, that 999 are blackish. So I was wondering whether we can interpret that as um, like in the previous day of Brahma that... Um, of course, and you can also interpret it a different way. In the, in the following Kali Yuga, after this Krishna appearance of Krishna, he's going to be golden. Mm -hmm. At least he knew. Whether he knew from scripture or he knew from his spiritual uh, acumen. Mm -hmm. It's one of the colors of... Yuga Avatar and Kali Yuga. Another question I have is um, regarding the three yuga that um, in one of the circulations about um, that you shared about Rupa Goswami's writings of uh, Lagu Bhagavata Amrita where he lists down different Leela Avatar. Um, in the Leela Avatar you also listed um, Lord Buddha, if I remember. So, um, how, how are we going to um, accommodate Deal with the fact the that Buddha appears in Kali Yuga and the statement by Gopinath Acharya says yes. there's no Yuga avatars, yes. me, no Leela avatars in Kali Yuga. Yes. I don't have the answer for that. Okay. I don't know if Buddha appears in every cycle of the four Yugas. Okay. I, don't, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. Okay. I've questioned that very point myself. I don't okay. have an answer. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Uh, is it recommended that we read Govinda Bhasya? Say it again. Uh, like you were mentioning Govinda Bhasya. Yeah, I mentioned, common? yes. Commentary on Vedanta Sutra. So, yes. is it recommended that we read it? Is it published <laughs> by BBT? Uh, it's not translated by BBT yet. But, you know, my recommendation is read Srimad Bhagavatam. Because it's the commentary on Vedanta Sutra. And because Jiva Goswami made this Sandarbhas, if you want to read something after Bhagavatam, after your you know, fully conversant in the Bhagavatam, become f conversant in the Sandarbhas because there's commentary on the Sandarbhas <laughs> by the author. And, you know, it, it's, it's very high, the Sandarbhas, and the commentary is similarly very high, but there's commentary at least. 
And I don't know about commentary on Gomen de Basio. I think our head would spin if we tried to read Gomen de Basio. What's he talking about? Something over here, ladies? Are we done? Questions? Okay. Question in the front? No, no. I'm making reference to it. Sure. Now, Madhupati, um, this was sitting on the table when I came in. Is that, is there a reason for that? Is it meant to be my copy or you want some announcement about copies or? I have to get it from India. Yeah. And that takes longer time to get it from India. So we were not able to get copies. So, so what, do, what do I do with this one? Give it to you? Well, you can refer it. I, mean, that, I think we had ordered one box last year. Yeah. So these are uh, some remaining. So probably I think it was kept. So there. I'll just go put it out at the re registration desk and she can decide what to do with it? Whoever wants to buy it, yeah. Okay. Oh, we have four or five copies, so whoever wants to get it, yeah. And that's part of what I understood from you, your intent was that would be part of the registration fee. That's true. That's what I want to do. But now I don't want to be partial to just give somebody a copy and somebody not a copy. So you know what to do, right? <laughs> we'll take breakfast. What time will we come back? It's now five minutes after nine. What's the schedule say? 10.15? See you again at 10.15. Thank you very much. Prabhupada Ki. Thank you.
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा